Ba-da. Bada boom. Sold. Huh? Just sold my car on Carvana. Dropping it off and getting paid today. Already? What? You still haven't sold yours? You told me about it months ago. I just... Is the offer good? Oh, the offer's great. Don't have another car yet? I could trade it in for this car I love. Come on! What are we waiting for? Ah, you're right. Let's go! Whether you're looking to sell your car right now or just whenever feels right, go to Carvana.com and sell your car the convenient way. Terms and conditions apply. His code name's Jackal. He's an exceptional assassin. Streaming November 14th on Peacock. He will kill again unless we stop him. Academy Award winner Eddie Redmayne. You're paying me to kill him. I am charging you for getting away. The Jackal's here. Look at the exits. BAFTA Award winner Lashana Lynch. I will find him and I will kill him myself. I like to win. So do I. The Day of the Jackal. Streaming November 14th only on Peacock. Being a marketer is no sweat. You just have to manage dozens of channels, launch hundreds of campaigns, score thousands of leads, and... Okay, fine. It's a lot of sweat. Unless you have HubSpot's AI-powered marketing tools to help you do all that and more. Get started at HubSpot.com slash marketers. Yes, Waz, Amin! <laughs> Welcome to North Carolina. You guys are in town for Dreamville Fest. Saw the gram. You guys look like you had a good time, huh? Yeah. Yeah, we, we were in town, but we've already gone. I'm back in LA now. What? All right, I left yesterday. Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We left. We 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 just went to North Carolina to see our friends, hang out with our friends, and then we went back home. That was that. Wait. Pretty much. So you flew across the country to North Carolina. You know I live in Charlotte, guys. Like I'm just down the road. Tom, you live in North Carolina? Dude. I thought you were in Connecticut. No, man. Oh. I thought you lived in Miami. Come on. I've been to your house. Right there on Biscayne. We were supposed to meet up. We were supposed to do this episode live, but then you guys were playing all like coy and stuff about your plans. When did you move to North Carolina? <laughs> Seriously. Bro, I've been here for six years. Oh, wow. I mean, you've been to my house. Yeah, in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> Remember? I got in the pool. My phone was in my pocket. Ridiculous. Next, you're going to tell me Will Smith's not a role model anymore. My assignment. Uncover why the association inspires more conspiracy theories in volume and salience than any other U.S. sport. You've heard of the Illuminati. The truth is out there, but so are lies. Your eyes can deceive you. Don't trust them. The NBA has always been controlled by about eight people. Denial is the most predictable of all human responses. If you're only using 10% of your brain, you don't even know that you're using 10% of your brain. The NBA Illuminati. If coincidences are just coincidences, why do they feel so contrived? The Illuminati. But you start to follow the money, and you don't know where the f*** is going to take you. It is unspoken. They have influence among other players. The NBA Illuminati. I don't have time for your convenient ignorance. Maybe I'm a conspiracist now as well. That's but all it took. Oh, we got books, we got schools. You saw a video on YouTube. <laughs> Why am I, eyes, sir? You've never used them before. We are the basketball Illuminati. <laughs> Welcome to Basketball Illuminati. I'm Tom Haberstroh, and I'm always joined here by my Basketball Illuminati comrades, Anthony Mays and Amin El Hassan. We've got a great jam-packed show for you today. We're going to talk later with our friend, our compadre, our truth-telling connoisseur, Big Waz, Wazzy Lambre from The Ringer. We're going to talk to him about Joel Embiid and the Doc Rivers stuff that's going on there. He's a newsbreaker now. We're also going to talk about the DNP rest scores that is taking over LeBron James and Kyrie Irving and really what's happening with those DNPs between Kyrie and LeBron James. But first... You are listening to The Agenda with Tom Haberstroh and Amin El Hassan. On the agenda, the thing that everyone's talking about, controversy in the NBA. I mean, 
Who's going to be this year's MVP? You have in one corner, the Denver Nuggets, Nikola Jokic, who is, in my opinion, seven foot Stephen Curry, his efficiency, his rebounding. He is a supernova. He's unbelievably good. And the Denver Nuggets are somehow really good. And they don't have Michael Porter Jr., and Jamal Murray this season. I think he's going to win MVP. But coming down to the wire, we have Giannis Antetokounmpo and Joel Embiid. Joel Embiid recently saying he thinks the media hates him. I mean, what do you think about the MVP race? First of all, this happens every year where we have to explain this to people again and again. All three of these guys are very, very deserving, right? There's no argument I can hear that'll say unequivocally, no one of those three guys should be the MVP. Meaning, you can't come to me and say, unequivocally, Jokic can't be the, the MVP. It just doesn't exist. They all have three separate, very strong arguments for why they should be MVP. But Joel Embiid says he's not going to win it because, as you said, Tom, the media, quote, hates him. And you know what, Tom Habistrow, Anthony Mays? You know what I have to say to Joel Embiid saying that, casting that aspersion across the media with regard to himself? He's absolutely right. <laughs> That's right, guys. Wow. wow. Yes, I agree. Uh. Joel Embiid is not going to win MVP because the media, it's not that they don't like him. That's the only part I disagree with because they don't like the Sixers. There's a strong anti-Sixer bias. We're going to hear a lot of it later on when we bring truth teller Wozni Lambre on the program. People don't like the Sixers. They don't like it. They don't like it. <laughs> to quote Zach Harper. There's a separate level of dislike they have for the Sixers and for James Harden. And those two dislikes have combined and joined forces to give you one big dislike. The Sixers, for whatever reason, rub media people the wrong way. Is it about the process from years ago? Maybe. Is it about the fact that they question Ben Simmons' mental health issues? Does he really have them? Maybe that too. Is it perhaps, maybe, just maybe, is it a level of Embiid always kind of being hurt and for a long time coasting on his reputation? Wow. Whatever it is, that dislike certainly exists out there amongst the NBA media and particularly the media electorate. And for that reason, I believe you, Joel Embiid. I stand with you. My third eye is wide open. My third eye is watching. It's not how the third eye works. You know how the third eye works, huh? I've studied it for many years. Is that yeah. so? I see the signs. I read the tea leaves. I see the writing on the wall. And I agree. You're not going to win MVP because they don't like you. Wow. I mean, remember when we did the turd deadline show at the Clevelander? Mm -hmm. What did we say? We said this is going to be an unwatchable team. We said that? I said that. I said they're going to be the most unwatchable team in the NBA because they're going to go to the free throw line all the time. Oh, yes, yes. That's another reason. They averaged 25 free throws made every single game, the most since 1991. Wow. It's been 30 years since we've seen that many free throws by a team. When James Harden and Joel Embiid play together, they average 25 free throws made for the team when they're playing. That would be the most since 1991 for any team. By the way, you know who else people don't like? You? Daryl Morey. Oh. Well, you know, they don't like me because of what I have to say. That's mm, why. Because yeah. they're afraid of what I have to say. Yeah. Because I expose people. But people don't like Daryl Morey because he's a little irreverent, right? And he's a little, uh, dare I say, a bit on the arrogant side. And that also factors in to the Philadelphia hate. I think the media, you're saying the media electorate don't like Daryl Morey, who's like one of the most available GMs who's out here on podcasts and interviews and quotes more than Daryl Morey. No, oh, he's available, but also he says things that I think rub people the wrong way. He says them a lot. Mm. I think just distaste of the Sixers game plan is just to try to get fouls. Remember early in this season, the referees weren't going to call those anymore. And sure enough, James Harden, Joel Embiid are going to the line just as much, if not more nowadays, now that we've totally forgotten about the new points of emphasis with the referees. And now we've seen more free throw attempts with this James Harden, Joel Embiid free throw bomb. It's been tough, right? It's been tough to watch. It's one thing to lose to Detroit. It's another to do it while you're just living at the free throw line. By the way, Tom, I want to add some fuel to your fire there about how the Sixers are taking and making more free throws than any team in the last 30 years. Surprised that you haven't pointed this out, that there's a very important thing that we should keep in mind. 
which is pace. The, the team that did that all those years ago was the Golden State Warriors, I believe, in 1991. They played at a pace that was wait, Maze. What do we have here? Do we have a mean doing his own research? That's what it sounds like. I'm doing my own research. I can see his furrowed brow as he scrolls through the annals of Basketball Reference. Not to be confused with the annals of Basketball Reference, but those Golden State Warriors in 1991, Tom, 103.6 possessions per game. Compare and contrast, if you will, with the Sixers of right now who are positively snail-like, 96.1 possessions per game, also according to basketball reference. So in actuality, they're actually shooting more free throws than even those guys did. And I think that rubs people the wrong way just aesthetically. It's not cool to cheer on free throws. Like It's cool to cheer on wins, and it's cool to cheer on if you're scoring 35 points a game like James Harden was a couple of years ago. But if it comes at the cost of these games are just miserable to watch, I don't think the media gets all excited about that. And I'll point this out too. In the MVP race, Joel Embiid, amazing defensive player. But let's point out the fact that Jokic is a much improved defensive player. And I hate the idea of people being like, he gives nothing defensively. And Embiid and Giannis play both ends of the floor. They're two-way superstars. It drives me nuts. If they are so good defensively, then why are their defensive ratings while they're on the court? The team defensive ratings. This is Phillies. Milwaukee and Denver's almost negligible differences from a defensive rating standpoint. When Jokic is on the floor, the Denver Nuggets are at 109. When Giannis is on the floor, it's at 107 for the Bucks. And when Joel Embiid is on the floor, it's 108 for the 76ers. Negligible differences. Tom, Tom, to further bolster that point, what you use was a, a quick and dirty method. But if you want to be super respectful to the analytics and the ability to filter out the noise, so to speak. One of my favorite stats, EPM, estimated plus minus from dunksandthrees.com. I love this website. And they do a nice little breakdown of your plus minus impact on both the offensive and defensive end, isolated and accounting for where you're playing and who the other people on your team are. And for those three players, who, by the way, coincidentally, are the top three overall EPM players in the league. Giannis Antetokounmpo, plus 1.3 on the defensive end. Joel Embiid, plus 1.9 on the defensive end. Nikola Jokic, plus 1.4 on the defensive end. He is smack dab in between Giannis and Embiid, two players who have far greater reputations on the defensive end than he does. But the difference between them is, at most, 0.5 between him and Embiid. That's right. And I think people don't realize how good Jokic's hands are. He has way more steals than those other guys have. And what people don't realize is blocks are only steals 57% of the time on average. Yeah. Sometimes they're just offensive rebounds. It goes back to the other team or the team that shot the ball 43% of the time. Tom, if I had a team that had a 43% offensive rebound rate, where would that rank in NBA history? Number one, far and away. But I don't like all this data that you've given us, Tom, because while you've made a very compelling argument for Nikola Jokic, you're taking away from my argument, which is that Embiid's not going to win it because they don't like him. Well, let's talk more about Embiid. We have a truth teller about to come onto the show, our old friend from back in the day who's killing it at the ringer. We got an interview, an exclusive with Big Waz, Wozni Lambre. Hey, listener, guess what? You can spark something uncommon this holiday with just the right gift. From our friends at Uncommon Goods. The busy holiday season is here and Uncommon Goods makes it less stressful with incredible hand-picked gifts for everyone on your list. Yep, mom, dad, sister, brother, anybody. Weird uncle, doesn't matter. All in one spot. Gifts that spark joy, wonder, delight, and that that's exactly what I wanted feeling. They scour the globe for original handmade, absolutely remarkable things. Somehow, they know exactly the perfect gift for every single person you know. How crazy is that? Like a big jolly guy that just knows what to do. Here are a few of my favorite gifts that I found on their site. You know, I had to get me a California spoon rest. You can do like embroidered stuff. Going to do that for my parents or for their dogs. You know, some pet embroidered sweatshirts and t-shirts and stuff. And the piece de resistance for all of our fans who also love football. 
that football bingo set of two that we can all enjoy every Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Thursday, whenever they got football games for you. When you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. Many of their handcrafted products are made in small batches. So shop now before they sell out this holiday season. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give back $1 to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $3 million to date. Let's get that number up by buying from Uncommon Goods. How do you do that, you ask? I'm so glad you posited that query. To get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash dings. That's uncommongoods.com slash dings, D-I-N-G-S, for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. Hello, listener. It is your favorite Butcher Turn podcast producer, Maze, here to talk to you about ButcherBox. One of the biggest holidays on the butcher calendar is Thanksgiving. I can tell you from the front lines of slinging turkeys that it gets hectic at the grocery store during Thanksgiving. And that's why your search for the perfect Thanksgiving entree ends with ButcherBox. Take the stress out of holiday meal prep with your choice of humanely raised whole turkey, turkey breast, or ham free in your first order, plus get $20 off. When you go to butcherbox.com slash dings and enter code dings at checkout, sign up today and get ready for your easiest Thanksgiving yet delivered right to your door order by November 19th to guarantee delivery by Thanksgiving. Spend less time at the grocery store and more time enjoying the holidays with your family. Go to butcherbox.com slash dings and enter code dings D I N G S at checkout to get this offer plus $20 off your first box. You all think I'm late. Well, I'm not late, and I'm going to stay right here and fight for this lost cause, even if this room gets filled with lies like these. And the tailors and all their armies come marching into this place. Somebody will listen to me. There's no better way to overpower a trickle of doubt than with a flood of naked truth. But the complexity in the gray lie not in the truth. But what you what do with the truth once you have it. What is true and right is true and right for all. You and I both know that that's just not the truth. You can't handle the truth! It's too messy. Keeps them up nice. I'm here because in the end, the truth is worth the risk. Speak a little truth and people lose their minds. I'm a grown man, you can tell me the truth. Why is it people who want the truth never believe it when they hear it? So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something really outrageous. I'm going to tell the truth. truth All right, we are now joined by Big Waz, a.k.a. Wozni Lambre, the Haitian sensation who has been doing phenomenal work at The Ringer. The blow-up has been fantastic to watch. And now you're adding insider newsbreaker <laughs> to your resume. I mean, did you catch the podcast you did with our guys, Rob Mahoney and Justin Barrier at group chat? Now, let me hear it. Aggregators relax. Cause I, I do want to share some things. One, like a few weeks ago, cause I'm decently tapped in with the player side of what's happening with the Sixers. No, I don't know anybody in the Mori administration. Anyway, I'm hearing like, some guys are not feeling doc. And his rotations, his philosophy, just like what he's doing, guys aren't feeling in. To me, sometimes, like, you could chalk that up to be like, I should be playing more. That's every NBA player. So I'm like, I'm ignoring this. I'm ignoring this. The Sixers are in L.A. last week. Mm. You know, I'm out and about getting dinner, having you? drinks, doing, <laughs> <laughs> doing, <laughs> doing what I do. And I run into somebody who's close to the team. And I'm like, you know, I'm fr- I've am i been friendly with this person for a while. So I'm talking shit. And I'm like, sorry, but I can't pick you guys to go to the finals this year. And and his response kind of raised my eyebrow. Neither would I. Ooh. Oh, oh okay. That's, <laughs> but maybe that's hyperbole. Maybe you're having a bad week. I'm not even thinking about it. But again, I'm keep, I'm, I'm, this is a running tally of what's going on down in Philadelphia. Then the Joel Embiid just clearly, clearly talking about, I don't know, maybe next time we should match my minutes with Giannis. Mm. We're not building a wall. We're not doing this. He's the best guy on their team. The best guy on their team scores 16 straight points. Maybe it's time, you know, strategy, game plan. Throws Doc Rivers under the bus. And now I'm just like, look, one strike, uh, whatever. 
two strikes. Uh, you know it is, but three strikes, fellas. Come on. I think we're on like twenty strikes with Doc. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> Like after the clip, I also just can't believe I can't believe Furkan Korkmaz told you. That. <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna guess Georges Niang actually. Right. <laughs> so Waz, did you have this in your back pocket that you were gonna break some news? You're gonna put on your Shams hat and be a newsbreaker in the NBA. I mean, it's only been a couple years since we were doing True TV lives together <laughs> at ESPN, and now you're breaking news. I'm definitely not a newsbreaker. That's not my bag. I think I'm better at analysis, if you will, for whatever that's worth. But I don't get into the news breaking game because I feel like you're always on the brink of snitching on people who you care about. I, like, I don't want to be in that space, right? <laughs> but it was like a pattern of stuff. Silly was. You think they care about those people? No, 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 no. And I was, <laughs> and I was very careful to say, like, look, I heard this from credible people. You got it. This isn't some... <laughs> Oh, I might have heard somebody drop something loosely. Like, this is credible stuff. And I prefaced it by saying, like, I had heard some stuff mm. months ago, complaints about Doc. But like I said on the show, one off or two off complaints, it could just be one person's gripe, which generally is just like, I should be playing more. Like, that's usually players either I should be playing more, I should be shooting more. Players aren't usually like, well, the lineup data says this and Doc's not doing that. <laughs> if they're not included in that lineup data, right? Like nobody's doing that as a player. So I kind of dismissed it. I was like, all right, it's probably, you know, a few guys not feeling Doc's rotations because they feel like they could individually be doing better. Then I hung out with some Sixers people very briefly while they were in town to play the Lakers and the Clippers. And like I said, I jokingly, jokingly was like, yeah, I don't think I could pick you guys to get out the East this year. Just <laughs> saying goodbye, like, y'all going to be whack this year. Like, y'all going to flame out in the playoffs and whatever. Just in a typical hater type of way, but you me could appreciate, like, you saying goodbye to somebody and you want to just throw some salt. Y'all going to get y'all ass bust this year in the playoffs, right? <laughs> and they laugh. They yeah, go, and then, and then yeah, they go yeah, on right. about I hear you, Waz. I hear you, whatever. Right. We'll show you, Waz. Right? right, exactly. Normal. And then the person says, well, I wouldn't pick us either. And I was like, damn. God. Okay. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's just straight up. You're going to keep hanging out. You got to explain yourself here. Like, you can't leave. On that, you're like, yo. No, I just stole that away. Isaiah Joe said that, huh? I just... <laughs> Various suggested that it was Furcon Corkmoss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you and Furcon at the club. Oh, uh, boy. And so, again, whatever. Cool. Not thinking about nothing. And then, Joel, after a game, and people were like, oh, he's just saying, like, this... Could be something, a strategy they could employ in future matchups or blah, 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 blah. But Joel, at the end of the game, says they're asking him about the part of the game where the game gets away from them. And Joel, in typical Joel fashion, throws everybody else under the bus. He's like, look, that happened while I wasn't playing, one. And then two, their best player goes on an individual 19-point run or something ridiculous like yeah, that. Yeah, this is a Milwaukee game. Yeah, he's talking about Giannis Antetokounmpo, and he said perhaps in the future we can minutes match, which, look, it's not hard to read in between those lines, right? Like, isn't Doc the one who would be settling upon that strategy? So I'm just putting stuff together. I'm just like, yo, dudes are openly saying better game plans in public, and then things that I've heard... Outside of that, in private, it's obvious to me. Did I jump out of the window for that? So my favorite part about that whole Embiid quote was that, yes, Giannis went on a crazy run, but Embiid was off the floor for only six of those points. <laughs> <laughs> it was a 16 to 4 run, but only six of those 12 points in that margin happened with Embiid off the floor, which, by the way, to me, is something that is more indicative, right? Because now we've crossed over from, damn, coach messed up, to bad things are happening. It's coach's fault. Mm. Even when you look at it mathematically, when you look at all right, how much of this damage actually happened because there was no minutes matching, only a, a spread of plus six. 
right? Doc got him beat back in there, and then they got outscored by four more points after that, by the way. <laughs> so to me, all of these things are kind of confirmations of stuff that, Tom, you and I talked about the day he got traded. Was that the first episode? I believe it was the first episode of Basketball Illuminati. We said, look, Doc's not long for this, this job because everything in there says Houston. Houston. President of Basketball Ops, Houston. The president of Business Ops, Houston. One of the owners, close ties to Harden from his Houston days. And so I don't feel like it's a stretch when we said it, but I guess now we're going to look like soothsayers and we say, yo, Mike D'Antoni's waiting in the wings. And this is the part of the plan that's complete because you can't go and hire Mike D'Antoni if Doc Rivers has full control and respect of his locker room. Right. But the moment you have a bunch of people asking questions about why can't we do it this way? Why can't we do it that way? And as Waz pointed out, not just guys bitching about their own minutes or their own shots and touches, but just overall strategic stuff. I think that we went to the danger zone. And by the way, Doc is throwing a little bit in there too. Oh, yeah. That Harden quote. Yo, Waz, you had your report, your breaking news scoop before. Here's Doc Rivers after the loss to the Pistons when Doc calls out a reporter out of the blue. Off the top rope. The bench unit struggled compared to their well, well, they didn't struggle. Um, you know, they didn't get a lot of shots, you know, in, in their defense. I think during that stretch, it was more James, you know, um, you know, than, than them. So, you know, um, yeah, that's just a tough night. Pew, pew. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so just like Waz, what you were talking about, and, and I mean, what you guys were talking about, how Joel Embiid was on the floor for what all of those six points against Giannis, he stuck his neck out to call out Doc Rivers when it wasn't really mathematically all that true, right? Right. So he needed to get that thing off of Doc. I watched that game and I watched those minutes where James Harden was playing with the bench unit. Essentially, Doc Rivers is calling out James for not passing the ball. I don't think that was a problem. James Harden, by the way, for the game, he took 15 shots. So Doc Rivers is saying that James Harden needs to pass the ball more or they didn't get shots. It was more on James. And James Harden was getting and ones. He was getting four-point shots. He was assisting Tobias Harris left and right. George Niang was getting blocked on three-point attempts. Like, it wasn't on James, but Doc made it about James. Doc made it about James Harden. Out of the blue. He could have gone with the reporter being like, yeah, the bench didn't pull their weight, but you know what? You know, you have bad nights in the NBA. It's a make or miss league. They didn't, they didn't hit their shots, but instead he goes out on a limb to go at James Harden. And I'm like, yo, what is going on here? I know what's going on. Waz, do you know what's going on? Look, it's tail covering season. It's obvious what's happening here. And here's my number one, something smells bad around the Sixers. Like I've had a pretty antagonistic relationship with the, Sixers fans online. You? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And I can remember those first few Harding games where they're kicking the Knicks' asses and yeah. it's looking amazing. <laughs> and oh my God, we're about to win the championship. Oh man, what a time that was. We're not going to lose for the rest of the year. And they were going nuts, right? And whatever. And that's fine. That's what fans do. That's what you're supposed to do. When you're up, gloat, do the whole thing. These aggregated people, Reddit people, they aggregate whatever I said on group chat. Doc says what he says about Harden, and I'm like, yeah, this is completely fine. Sarcastically said that. And crickets. Like, there was a few people he was like, oh, yeah. look, they're just stating the obvious facts. Nobody's coming at anybody. But when I see nobody responded to that, when you know fans online specifically, not fans in real life, online are always trying to cape for everything that happens around the team. Everything is a good sign or everything is a nothing burger. There's nothing negative ever happening when everybody was just like, yeah, nah, this, this, this don't look right. You know something's there, but I mean, you said you're seeing something else with the doc stuff. Yeah, he had another theory. I can't believe everyone's missing this one. Maybe you guys need to open your third eyes here. Mm. <laughs> so we established that the Sixers probably want someone else to be their head coach, namely Mike D'Antoni. Hold on, hold on. Before you go on, I mean, another thing. Uh -huh. I see a report today. Oh, yes. That the Lakers yes. oh, are interested oh. Oh. in Quinn Snyder oh. and Doc Rivers. Well, wait a minute. Oh. Huh? <laughs> wait, oh, wait, oh, oh, oh. Oh, wait, oh, Doc, how's that work? Doc is with is the... there more to the story, perhaps? <laughs> and and then, we know what I just saw right there, ladies and gentlemen, on the Zoom. I just saw Waz's third eye just, <laughs> just expand. It's the size of his entire forehead right now. Guys, 
Doc Rivers signed a deal in 2020 to be the head coach of the Philadelphia 76ers worth five years, $40 million. Wait, was that before Daryl Morey came on board or was that after Daryl Morey came on board? Before Daryl Morey. Oh, so wait, they hired the coach before the president of basketball operations? No, 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 no. They hired the coach and he was hired by their general manager. And then they decided they needed a president of basketball operations, which, by the way, (gasps) is not entirely too different from what happened in Utah, albeit a lot longer tenure for the coach. But you had a coach, you had a general manager, and the Utah just said, "Mm, you know what I want? I want want a president of basketball operations. And then you bring in Danny Ainge. And what we know about presidents of basketball operations are like people who buy new houses. They want to paint the rooms the color they like. They want the hardwood floors, get rid of the carpet. They're going to move the couch. You have the couch over here. We're going to have the couch over here. They do things their own way. Got to open it up. Got to knock that wall down. Yeah, open floor plan. So if you are Doc Rivers and you know there's an opportunity out west for me to be a head coach, that is perfect because they're, they're trying to make moves and everything else. I want that. But I don't want to give up $20 million. Do <laughs> Come on. I'm not an idiot. So what I do is I stay here and I do things that I, Doc Rivers, are far too nuanced and experienced hmm. of a coach to do the faux pas of throwing the star player, the beloved new acquisition who has ties to the president, who has ties to one of the owners, I'm going to throw him under the bus. For who? Not for Embiid's sake, right? Not for Maxi's sake, his up-and-coming star. Nope. For the bench guys. For Furkan Korkmaz. For Furkan Korkmaz. It ain't Furkan's fault. (laughs) Savvy play by Doc Rivers. Here's the report from BR's Jake Fisher, who we cited on this show before. Truth teller. Truth purveyor. Is Jake Fisher the one that first reported the Harden grumblings and rumblings. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Jake Fisher. I doubted your report. You had that thing <laughs> on the nose. There you go. Hey, see, Waz is doing what his haters in Philly won't do, is acknowledging when he was wrong about something. I was wrong about that. I was like, come on, man. Have you gotten a formal apology from Pablo Torre yet? About what? Just being a process truther for 50 years? <laughs> yes. I'm going to call him about that, actually. So here's the report. There is, however, a healthy dose of skepticism around the NBA that Snyder would have interest in a hypothetical Lakers marriage. Snyder was there for a year or whatever. Doc Rivers, the Philadelphia 76ers head coach, is another active bench leader being mentioned by league personnel as a potential Lakers candidate. Rivers' tenure in Philadelphia has also come into question of late, spurred by team president Daryl Morey's deadline acquisition of James Harden. And here it is, folks, the mounting speculation that followed about a potential reunification with Harden's former Rockets head coach, Mike D'Antoni. And then continues, Rivers has also been linked by several league sources as a potential replacement for the Jazz. In the event Snyder does part Utah, Rivers was the head coach in Boston from 2004 to 2013 under current Jazz CEO, Danny Ainge. Mm, the QB carousel just stopped spinning in the NFL. It's time to fire up that head coaching carousel. Doc Rivers not signing up to be Danny Ainge employee again. I don't buy that, Utah. What do you mean? Why is they won a championship? <laughs> All that Ubuntu. You think that's just going <laughs> to... Bring it back. <laughs> that's going to salvage the Ainge relationship? Yeah. yeah, I find that very hard to believe. It'll do great in Utah, too. <laughs> I'm sure the fans will get on board with that. Oh, you laugh, Maze. But I submit to you, the next head coach of the Utah Jazz is going to be a black man Mm. or a black person. It could be a black woman. Why do you think that is? Everything that Utah has done under its new ownership slash since George Floyd has been leaning more and more black friendly because that's the rap that Utah as a location and as a franchise is that it's not friendly towards African-Americans. And that's why they have problems signing free agents. And so what they've done in the last couple of years of hirings and signings have all been reflected. The D. Wade situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A concerted effort to make Utah more black friendly. So I believe the next head coach of the Jazz is going to be a black person. And so Doc Rivers obviously fits that mold. It's interesting to see what wins out. Was I think a lot of that also has to do with the jobs that are available, right? Like, Doc isn't trying to angle his way out of Philadelphia to do TNT. No. 
he's doing it because I might get an opportunity. And you, you go to Utah, and what we know about Utah is when they are a coach, they usually stick with that guy for a while. Yeah, at least close to when your contract is up, bro. Yep. They're not wasting no money firing you and paying you to coach five other teams the way Mike Brown did <laughs> for, right. for so many years. But, man, as much as Doc loves the golfing, he loves Malibu, he, he really loves the trappings of West Coast, Southern California living. I'd be surprised if the Lakers job was there and he passed it up. Oh, no. If it's an option, I think that's his number one option is the Lakers job. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as we know, life, they know it's about the choices that we get to make. It's the choices that we have to make. And it really depends on where Quinn goes. If Quinn goes to San Antonio, then I think that opens up the Laker job for Doc. But if Quinn takes the Laker job, then now Doc's looking at San Antonio or Utah. Maybe the New York Knicks, perhaps? <laughs> Bing bong! Oof. Once a Nick, always a Nick. <laughs> Part 75. Part 75,000. Why go with Tibbs, Doc's assistant, when you can just go get Doc? Come on now. <laughs> the Knicks are going to have an opening this season, by the way, this offseason. Ain't no way they bringing Tibbs back again. I don't know. Did you hear our analysis that uh, for the lost graphics, they put Tom Thibodeau as the face of the loss seven times. The only coach in the NBA to be the face of a lost graphic multiple times this season. Dude, I saw this kid on YouTube put together an analysis of the Lakers lost graphic and LeBron. Bro. That's what inspired us. We went and we did one across the league and looked up all the stars and all the guys. And you'll be happy to know that the Lakers are the only team that had any star, really, not have <laughs> not even a single appearance. Not even Westbrook. <laughs> Westbrook, immediately after our podcast came out, Westbrook was put on and lost, but no oh. LeBron yet. Yeah, no LeBron. My favorite thing was, was the Knicks had Thibodeau seven times, and on one, they had Allen Houston. And that one really confused us, yeah. Basketball ops guys are, are being the faces of losses now. It can happen. Real creative over there in New York. Yeah, shout out to the Knicks. Well, Waz, <laughs> when you say something smells funny in Philly, if you can point to basketball reasons why things aren't working, is it just the rotations you're talking about with Doc? Or is there other stuff with James Harden and the rest of the team that hasn't been great since James Harden got with Doc? I think whenever you amass this amount of talent or at least perceived talent. Like, I think the players themselves think they're a talented bunch and the results don't match up. The players are going to say that it's somebody else. Whereas in defense of Doc, I think people like us who are kind of like nerdier and more analytical about a Harden deal from the beginning was like, all right, they're going to score, but it's going to be hard for you how to guard people if you're playing Harden and Maxi and Tobias big minutes. As great as Joel is, y'all not really going to guard people with those guys out there. Wait, are you saying DeAndre Jordan isn't going to be able to guard people in the playoffs oh when gosh. Embiid steps off the floor? Is that what you're saying? I mean, the guy who hasn't done anything since Dallas was supposed to come in here and spell Joel in big minutes. The defense can be ugly at times. And I think the results, they derive from that fact. So, yeah, Doc Rivers is like, look, y'all trash on D. <laughs> <laughs> and some of my guys are one-way guys. Like, Tybal, as good as he is on defense, in that Bucks game, they treated him like Tony Allen. Yep. We're just not going to guard you when you're on the floor. Maxi, a lot of juice on the ball. He's a menace when he gets going downhill. He lives in the paint. All of that dies on every single freaking screen. James Harden, we don't even need to discuss what he does. And Tobias Harris, one of the least scrutinized max players maybe in the history of the league, is not a good defensive player either, right? So Sixers fans have been killing me on Twitter all year because I suggested that if they would have had Kyle Lowry last year, they probably would have went to the finals and could have won that thing. That's how much I think of Kyle Lowry. That's what I thought they were missing. But it's like, Maxi. oh, every time he scores 21, Maxi. man. I'm like, yeah, he's a, he's a nice young player. He gets busy on offense. He's horrible at defense. And he's kind of redundant on the ball with what James Harden wants to do because we know Harden, when he gives the ball up, he does absolutely nothing in the play, right? So it's not to say that, you know, the kid's a bad player, but 
y'all understand what I'm saying. The defense is bad. When James Harden and Beat are on the floor together, their offensive rating is 121. Defensive rating is 106. Okay. Net 15, plus 15. That's really good. Their offense is crazy good, as, as expected. Last year with Simmons and Embiid on the floor, their offensive rating was 118, so just three points below offensively. But defensively, they were 102, so four points better defensively. So statistically, they are slightly better offensively, but significantly worse defensively. So net-net, they're at 15, right? With Ben Simmons last year in Embiid, and then 15 again with James Harden. So come playoff time, that's a lot on Joel Embiid's shoulders for defensively. Exactly what you're talking about is they get rid of Ben Simmons defensively as a huge minus, and then they don't have Andre Drummond backing up Embiid anymore, and they got DeAndre Jordan. That's a lot on Embiid's shoulders, right? And I think one of the things that we haven't mentioned is even offensively. They're not a good three-point shooting team outside of a couple of guys. Yeah. And so that makes things more difficult, especially when we get to the playoffs, is their ability to space the floor. But, Waz, I want to ask you, we all have the vibe that Doc Rivers, wherever he is next year, it's not going to be as Philadelphia's head coach. But what do you see for this Sixers team moving forward in terms of who could be a guy that could coach that team and is paying James Harden a shit ton of money? Is that going to be something that they're going to regret? I don't know that... They'll regret it, especially when you consider how poisonous the Ben Simmons thing was. And even I think guys like Bradley Beal have lost their luster. It's either Dame, Bradley Beal, or James Harden, right? So I don't think they're going to regret getting the Harden out of it. But it's going to be a horrible deal after he signs it. That's a one. And two, I'm not bullish on the future of what this deal is going to yield because I've been saying it over and over. Harden has become extremely reliant on the foul stuff way more than he used to be. Like, at least he used to be able to dribble past, I want to say, like 85% of the guys the NBA could put on him, if not higher than that. But now you could switch decent defenders onto him and he's not dribbling past that guy. He's not going to beat his guy one-on-one. And in the playoffs, we've seen it over and over and over again. You're not getting those foul-seeking behavior foul calls. You're not going to get it. So how is this guy going to be an elite threat at his position if he's not doing all of that? So, no, I mean, I'm not optimistic about this. (laughs) But I don't think you can regret it because Ben's thing got so bad. And now he's got a bulging dick. Whoa. (laughs) Ah. Whoa! <laughs> Jesus! Whoa! Why? Let's get Waz and Epidural stat. <laughs> god damn! Five dudes! Oh my god! Five dicks! Damn! No, but allegedly this guy's got a bulging disc. It was so awful. How can you really regret, even as bloated as the next Harden deal is going to be? Right. Even though you're firing another coach behind it. Despite all of that stuff, the Ben stuff was just so toxic. You can't be mad at this result. Yeah, my only question with that was, is did they have a chance to get Dame this summer with Ben Simmons? No, you can aggregate this too. Zero chance. I heard Dame wants no part of those people. That's what I heard. Aggregators! Moan up! That's what I heard. And how you know it's true is that he put the stuff out about the trade last summer. Sixers would have had... No problem moving Simmons last summer for this dude. It's out there. So they obviously did their due diligence. Like, yo, what's up, Dame? And he was like, nope, don't do it. The two things were there. He soft launched the trade request last (laughs) summer, (laughs) slow rolled it out. And then he kind of was like, "Ah, take it back, whatever. But it was out there because he wanted teams and people to know that it was out there. Again, the Sixers wanted no parts of Ben Simmons since the beginning of last season. They get to the end of that season. Dane makes a trade request and nothing happens. There's no mutual interest, meaning Dame Lillard don't want those people. So no, get that Dame stuff out of here. He has no interest in those cats. Any thoughts on Tiger Woods rolling in with foot joys? Bro, I ignored that entire Tiger situation. Is he still faking like he's not going to play this weekend? No, I'm just saying. He's not wearing Nikes anymore. Full court fits. Oh, what's he rocking now? Foot joy. I don't know what that is. The hell is foot joy? Like, what is that? Foot joy is the golf (laughs) shoe. It's the golf shoe. It's a company 
that puts out golf shoes and it is not Nike. Wait a second. Tiger's not a Nike athlete anymore? That's what everyone's wondering is what's going on with that. Next on Golf Illuminati. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you right now, it's already kind of out there a little bit. They might have lost Tiger, but they got somebody else coming. Who's that? Somebody we saw in North Carolina this last weekend. No. No way. Wait, it wasn't me because you didn't see me in North Carolina. Holy smokes. You know, I noticed that he's rocking them on stage and I'm like, hold on. At your own festival, simulcast on Amazon Prime. This is. Mm, this could have been about me, okay. Maze, if they had just seen me. Yeah. Mm, I like that. Maybe. Perhaps. A little mm. extra nugget for everybody there. Aggregators. Yeah, aggregators. Heard it here first. I want to know where you're at with the Harden thing. Because just as uh, <laughs> the process was a complete flop devotee that I am, <laughs> <laughs> I was watching this thing to see if it was going to crash and burn. And it hasn't crashed and burned, but I don't think. It's been this complete fix everything that you would have been led to believe immediately afterwards. Oh, God. It's such a straw, man. The process wasn't that it was infallible. The process wasn't about like it's 100% guaranteed, absolute is going to end up in a championship. It's just a good know, hand in poker. You numbers people love the process so much. Straw man. Yes, the math on the process made sense, Tom. No, but you're sitting here being like that. Everyone's talking about how this is a perfect plan. It'll always work no, out. You're going to no, win no, all no. these titles. You're going to start a dynasty. No, 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 no. It's a straw man. I had one problem. Calling somebody a genius for figuring out that you get more lottery balls when you lose. And it's just like, yo, let's do this until we draft KD or LeBron. And that's the genius plan? Yeah. That's the plan. Come on, bro. Why has no one ever thought of that before? That's the plan. And listen, this is my favorite part about it, especially as a GM. This is where media people fuck this up. Yeah. As a GM. Truth telling. It's in your best interest for your job to say, it's going to be better in the future. Keep me hired forever. Watch how this works out in 25 years and pay me to do it that whole 25. Just pay me in perpetuity until I draft LeBron. And media people was like, he's a genius. This is the stuff that my mother used to tell her friends about. My son is a genius. My son is a genius. He unlocked it. Facts. Team building. Facts. Media people, name names. Pablo Torre. Get your ass out of here, Pablo Torre. <laughs> no, wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> and Tom Hanks. You're acting like everyone knew that three was greater than two, but who's out here shooting three pointers in the eighties and the nineties. We all knew that three was more than two until someone stepped in and was like, yo, why aren't we taking threes? And you're acting like, Oh, because you implement this strategy doesn't make you a genius when everyone is sitting on the other side of the table being like, no, two is greater than three. Was, let me tell you a little something about Silicon Valley and what we call a disruptor. All right. <laughs> yes. Sam Hinkie is the disruptor of the NBA. That's what the process was. And where is he right now? Where is Sam Hinkie? Silicon Valley. He's in the Bay. Dude, nothing's changed about tanking. People were doing it before his ass. People were doing it afterwards. It's just that nobody's broadcasting the idea that I should be the GM until we draft the next KD. That's insane, Tom. That's just insane as a concept. I should have my job until I draft LeBron. And we're going to be a completely unwatchable product. We're essentially not going to participate in the NBA as a concept. We're not going to participate in competitive basketball for as long as it takes for me to draft LeBron or Shaq. I love this. That's insane. Or Joel Embiid, who is now currently the all-time leader in points per minute, just past Michael Jordan. He ain't Shaq. Hey, man. Steve Jobs got fired from Apple, too, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, he ain't Shaq. And by the way, Tom, according to that plan, you should keep going. Yeah. Joel didn't work. He wasn't Shaq. He doesn't change my life enough. Let's start the losing train again. Trade him for picks. Yep. Let's go. Hey, when it's Sam Presti doing it, it's cool. Oh, God, I'm not cool with the Presti praise either. I wish we could live in a world where Presti actually has to make every single one of those picks. Nobody falls for the gaffle and is like, no, let me take some off your hands or here's a superstar for it. I wish we lived in a world where we, the Thunder had to make every single one of those picks. They had to have like 12 first rounders. So I could watch media people be like, yeah, maybe that wasn't the genius shit that I thought it was. 
I'm having a tough time picking between my favorite son, whether it's Poku or whether it's Shangun. <laughs> <laughs> Can't pick. It's Josh Giddy. <laughs> it's a real Sophie's choice, Tom. That's his choice. <laughs> really is. I mean, Poku, did you see him the other night? He was unbelievable. He had 11 assists as the point guard, a 20 year old, like seven feet tall. Oh, he was unbelievable. Huh? Poku's unbelievable. By the way, Jalen Green has looked incredible for his age, where he's at, and his development, and all of that, these last few months. Yeah. The amount of hipster media pub that Jalen Green busting ass has gotten, donuts. Zero. Nobody gives a shit. And this kid is going to be 10 times the player of this Shen Goon dude. What? 100%. Get him out of here. <laughs> wow. That's it, Was. Wow. That's it, Was. Too much truth. Too much <laughs> truth. Get out. 100%. The Shen Goon squad slander. Get out of here with that. Not on this show. Not on this show. Who would have taken Shen Goon number one overall? Please hand your third eye in on your way out. <laughs> I once was lost. But now I'm found I was blind But now I see I don't know if you noticed this, Maze, I mean, but on Monday afternoon, the NBA announced the tip-off times for the regular season finale on Sunday, April 10th. They announced the actual game times for those games. Nice. All year long, April 10th, Sunday's games have just been TBD because we don't know which ones, quote unquote, matter and which ones won't. You have an idea, but, you know, they like to schedule it so that the biggest games have the best time slots. So what do we got here, Tom? Yeah, it's the only day in the NBA calendar that all 30 teams play. There's 15 games and we wait until the last week to kind of slot those games, probably to maximize or optimize Whatever the NBA needs, you know, whatever the NBA wants to happen, they're going to have those games in the right order. Once they figure out what ref is going to what game so they can put it <laughs> on what television channel. Yeah, I understand. Basketball Illuminati. So I found something really interesting. The last time slot is 930 Eastern and the NBA has put six games in that final time slot. And all of them are West Coast because they're the late games. You got San Antonio, Dallas, the Lakers at Denver, OKC at Clippers, Golden State at New Orleans, Sacramento at Phoenix. And then lastly, you have Utah at Portland. And if you notice in those games, I mean, there are a lot of teams that are in that three seed, four seed race in the Western Conference. You got Golden State, Denver, Dallas, and Utah in there. And you also have that final slot in the play-in. You have the Lakers, the Spurs, and the Pelicans mm -hmm. all in that last six games at 9.30, same tip-off. So we're going to have this like photo finish, both with the seedings in the Western Conference, but also the play-in game race. Sounds exciting. But I want the Illumin Army out there to sit down and open up their third eye. Oh, man. Because the Los Angeles Lakers got the latest time slot but did you notice where Milwaukee and Philly were? I didn't mention them there. Yeah, no, they're not in those. Like, all those games were Western Conference games, Tom. I don't know where you're going with this. Two words. Scoring title. Mm. Two words. LeBron James. Mm. Hold on. Wait a second. When does Milwaukee play? At Cleveland, 3.30 tip-off. Early in the day. What about Philadelphia? You ready for this? 7 Eastern, two and a half hours before LeBron tips off. So LeBron will tip off and... Barring a triple overtime scenario, he will know exactly how many points he needs to score in order to catapult his scoring average above his two other rivals in this race, Giannis Antetokounmpo and Joel Embiid. Or he doesn't need to play at all. Wait oh. a second, Tom. Hold the phone. Hold the hell up. I'm taking a look at the points per game leaderboard right now, right? As of our recording on Tuesday, April 5th. That's right. And what I've got here is LeBron James leads the league at 30.3. Joel Embiid is second at 30.2. Giannis Antetokounmpo is third at 30.1. So you're saying, you're positing, you are theorizing, you are hypothesizing. No, I'm just stating facts. I'm saying the NBA chose the time slot for the Lakers. Before we get to that selection, I just want to say what you are theorizing, hypothesizing, and positing is that by the time LeBron James is set to take the court, 
he will know either unequivocally whether or not he even needs to play, and if he does, exactly how many points he needs to cement this thing. That's right. Now, keep in mind, keep in mind, there's a little curveball here with Dan Wykey over at the LA Times reporting. Stay Wykey. And I kind of forgot about this, I mean, that to qualify for the NBA scoring title, you have to play at least 58 games. And LeBron James right now is at 56. And he has decided on Tuesday, he's going to sit out the Phoenix game, which a little bit of a trend here. When he has to play a really good team, a good defense, he's sitting out. But when he has to play the Pelicans, who are what, 10 games under 500, he decides to play. But, you know, everybody else who's really good, LeBron James decides to sit. Well, Tom, they're competing with the Pelicans for the play-in game. Mm. There's incentives. That's a really important game. That's way more important than getting waxed by Phoenix for the fourth time this year. Yeah, look at those scoring titles that LeBron had in those games against Pelicans. Anyway, what I'm saying here is LeBron James has to play two of the final three games, at least, in order to qualify for the scoring title. And he's got, coming up, at Golden State on Thursday, then back home at formerly known as the Staples Center. Crypto. Got OKC in the second game of the back-to-back. Crypto. And then he's got the Denver Nuggets on Sunday. So I'm just painting the picture here. LeBron James goes against his boy, Draymond Green, who has already said on the record on his podcast, by the way, Draymond Green has already said that if LeBron passes Kareem next year, he is going to bail on the Warriors if the Warriors have a game, skip the Warriors game just to go see LeBron pass Kareem for the all-time scoring record. LeBron James is going to go against Draymond Green and the Golden State Warriors. You know, one of the funniest things, not to derail you, but just because we are truth tellers here, we are people who expose things that I don't think the average NBA fan knows. A lot of people think that LeBron and Draymond have like a contentious relationship. Even after the incident between them in the 2016 finals, Draymond had dinner with LeBron, Maverick, and Rich Paul during those finals. I don't know how many people know that or aware that whatever their relationship is on the court, off the floor, it's awfully chummy. Very. Chummy enough, Tom, to maybe perhaps, you know, in a game that may not mean much for Golden State or may mean everything, Maybe you let your guy, you know, get a couple freebies up in here. That's right. You got OKC, Golden State. Let's say LeBron plays in those two games to qualify. Then he's got the Sunday game, the last slot of the night, and he's watching. Who watches more basketball than LeBron James? He's watching Milwaukee play, see what Giannis' scoring line is, see what Embiid's scoring line is. And then right up until the game time, he can decide whether he's actually going to play. Now, LeBron James, he might be actually a game time decision on Sunday, but it would behoove him to call himself questionable. And it's a game time decision, whether he's going to play or not, just to see if he wraps up the scoring title, which by the way, he hasn't done since Ben Wallace was a center for him in Cleveland since 2008. And he would be the oldest player ever passing Michael Jordan in 98 when he was 35 years old, won the scoring title. LeBron James would be the oldest player ever to win the scoring title at 37 years old. It's going to mean something to him to get that. But Tom, he's not a scorer. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. Uh, Tom, I don't know, man. I don't know if that's enough time for him to see how many points are going to be put up before his tip off. Surely he has to let somebody know on the Lakers that he might not suit up. If he can play, certainly there's no way that LeBron James would sit down with so much on the line. So this is a fun little tidbit right here. LeBron James against Golden State this season, three games played. You know what he's averaged? 38.7. You're damn right. LeBron James against Oklahoma City in one game, what he's averaged or what he scored, 33 points. And then finally, LeBron James in one game against Denver this year, 25 points. Oh, can't mess with that. Yeah, man. Uh oh. Can't risk that. A little danger zone. What if he turns his ankle in the first five minutes of that game? He can. I mean, that's going to be a big old zero. Oh, that would be a disaster. What if there's a loose floorboard? Disaster. That's why he's got to get it done. Guys, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, yeah, he's going to play in these games and he's going to get every last point he can. Yep. And if they lose at Phoenix, they could be eliminated. And then it's just scoring Tyler a bust for LeBron. At least that makes it easier. Yeah. We don't have to actually win these games as well. If we can just be transparent is that LeBron's sitting out these games and he'll strategically play in them if it makes it an advantage for him to get the scoring title. He could have it wrapped up. He could have it wrapped up on Sunday night against Denver. 
and he could sit out. And whether the ankle feels right or, or his knee feels right or not, it might not even matter. He's got that scoring title to wrap up. You might be sitting here, me and Mays being like, you know what, like seven o'clock tip for the 76ers. Is there really something there? Check the calendar, I mean. Last time they're at home on a Sunday, what time was the tip? I want you to look this up. I want you to do your own research here, just like you were earlier. Sunday, March 20th, they hosted the Toronto Raptors. That was an 8.30 tip. Mm. Mm. Huh. That's right. I mean, 8.30 tip local time for Philly. That's a very late start. Very late start, especially when you have to know if LeBron James has the scoring title wrapped up. That is not enough time for LeBron to know whether he should be playing in the season, regular season finale on that Sunday. I mean, I just want to say here for the people out there, the NBA is in a weird place right now where the star players, the superstars have embraced load management. Mm -hmm. They are embracing strategic DNPs, strategic rest. Who knew that when Greg Popovich was strategically resting his players, he would inspire Kawhi Leonard to take off entire seasons. (laughs) Well, if you remember, Mays, where were the Spurs when they rested Tim Duncan, Manu Ginobili, and Tony Parker? Where were they when they basically sent them home rather than bring them to a national TV game? Do you remember where they were? I was going to say Miami. That's right. And who was on the other side? there watching that happen. LeBron, Raymond, James. That's right. Look, it's taken the league by storm. DNP rests. I was kind of ahead of that. I'm going to toot my own horn here is that I was writing about that for ESPN a lot when GMs, coaches, players, trainers were all complaining about that behind closed doors and no one was really covering it. And then the NBA changed their schedule. They got rid of five and sevens and four and fives. And they made it a little bit easier on the players for the product. And they got rid of national TV games being on second night of back to back. But I'm just saying it's a huge thing in the game now where the MVP candidates, they're not playing 82 games anymore. You know, last year, yes, Jokic, but that was an anomaly. Like this year, you're seeing a lot of star players miss 15, 20, 30, 40 games. And that's just the norm. But I always look at this with a little bit more of a third eye. Kyrie Irving, you guys notice what's happening with Kyrie Irving this year? Just one thing, Tom? What do you mean? (laughs) Why don't you be a little more specific when you talk about our patron saint of basketball Illuminati, Kyrie Irving? As I burn sage across my idol and my shrine that I have constructed in my apartment to Kyrie. The media has been all over this. I don't know if you guys caught Bill Simmons and Ryan Russillo talking about Kyrie Irving and his scoring totals when he has rest and when he doesn't have rest. I up a good point here because you had said you were texting me before and you said, you know, maybe it's a little different now when Kyrie doesn't get to play erratically because clearly like I went through it again when he dropped 50 on yeah. Charlotte. It was his second game in nine days. And when he dropped 60 on Orlando, it was his first game. It was one game in a 12 day span. So I've been making this point for a while. Like it's, if you only have to play once a week, basketball is a lot easier. I did not catch the podcast, but I am aware that Kyrie does better when he's been resting for about a week. (laughs) I think it's smart, smart analysis. I think it's spot on. I think if you're looking at Kyrie Irving and his ability to play better when he has more rest, But I don't think we're going quite far enough with this. No? Wait, what else do you have? That seems pretty straightforward, Tom. He wasn't allowed to play in home games, so that's why he had all that time off. But now he's allowed to play in home games, and now his schedule has become considerably more compressed. Is there more to this? Is my third eye shut? Is it winking? I mean, what if I told you that Kyrie knew this about himself? He knew that he was a better player when he was well-rested, and that he didn't get vaccinated because of his beliefs off the court, but his beliefs on the court. Wait a minute. Okay. Wow. Hold on. Are you suggesting that he voluntarily became a part-time player because he knew that he is at his best as a part-time player and all of the vaccine mandate stuff, that is just a cover? He found his way to Brooklyn, New York, one of the most strict vaccination cities in the whole country. He found his way into a situation where he could have time to recuperate and heal up his body so he could come into these games fresh. And he put up some of the best numbers of his whole career, Tom. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. (laughs) Amazing. I'm on basketball reference right now. I'm on basketball reference right now. I'm going to do some math here. I'm going to do some research. Wait. (laughs) Oh, no. So we're talking about this season and the 50 burger and the 60 burger. But what about Kyrie Irving? With three plus days rest, previous three seasons, 
Oh my God. <laughs> He's averaging 28 points per game with three plus days rest over his previous three seasons. Forget about this year. Heading into this season, when the Vax mandate question was swirling around the league, yeah. he decides to become a part-time player, the most high-profile player to do so. His shooting percentages in his previous three seasons with three-plus days rest, 50% from the floor, 44% from downtown, and 93% from the free-throw line. Well-rested Kyrie Irving is MVP caliber numbers. Then in all other games, previous three seasons, 24.9 points per game, 49% from the floor, 38% from downtown, 89% from the free throw line. So he's a 50, 40, 90 player averaging 28 a game when he's well arrested and then 24 and slightly lower percentages when he's not. This was all preordained, you're saying? He knows what you know, Tom, that the NBA would have a higher quality product if there was more time to rest. If we weren't locked into this antiquated 82 game schedule trying to meet the demands of our corporate overlords, trying to put out as many games as possible instead of embracing the future of basketball, which is one or two games a week. Did he realize that he couldn't play a full season after he got hurt in the middle of the playoffs last year? Oh, he knows everything, Tom. Wow. I heard that segment from Bill Simmons and Ryan Russillo, but I didn't realize how blind I truly was until I just listened to you, Maze. Those two just stumbled behind the curtain. I've been back here <laughs> for months now. Just me and Kyrie breathing sage deep in my lungs. I see so clearly now. I feel like I've been double blind because I didn't see the LeBron thing coming either. But now I see. Y'all know what the real hit of the weekend was, right? The real hit of the weekend? Yeah, I wore my basketball Illuminati hoodie out, and man, the people were loving it. Mm. Love the podcast. What color did you go with? The black hoodie with the blue logo on it. And everywhere I went, man, people were like, loving the podcast, love listening to Levitard. And the people who didn't know what it was said, that's cool as shit. They wanted it. So we're getting the word out there. We're getting the vibe out there. If you want to really get the vibe out there, I mean, you guys will send me a hoodie so I can wear it all the time. <laughs> <to sit here. laughs> oh, oh Wazzy, you haven't changed. <laughs> Next time you hang out with Danny Green, you can be like, hey, I talked whoa, about whoa, you on the whoa, pod. Whoa, whoa, Next whoa. thing you know, we're going to get invoice for whoa, IG whoa. exclusive content where Waz is wearing the hoodie, posing with Mimi whoa, at the crib. Whoa, whoa. Uh, the last thing I'll do is explore Shake Milton as a source. You guys are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> if you think I'd ever do that. <laughs> Shake and bake, baby.